actually uh, encouraged John to move it to this particular spot where I really wanted it to be and came to the meetings where we met with the city and people that lived in the court to the neighbor could come and say if they had anything against it moving here. And this particular spot here was pre-cooled in the most cliched of manners, but uh, the, the other places where we've done the readings, these great American poets that have passed away since it all come, you know? And so uh, the Laughing Goat was going to move somewhere, and we were going to move the poetry readings somewhere. And I thought if they moved them here, that all these poets that had been to the readings uh, that were had passed away had all been in this room. Because when this was Bullfrogs, uh, I came here with Alan Ginsberg and Lawrence Burling Daddy and, uh, you know, like Harris Schiff and Ann Waldman, and, you know, under literally under different poets. Because when we did the poetry readings at Penny Lane, in the late 90s, before and after the reading, we would come down here for a drink when this was bullfrogs. And so uh, this particular space here, in addition to being the Salvation Army, like uh, was a, a modern, was a cinema called the I Cinema in the early 80s, where they had a screen. It's actually, they tore down the roof, they tore off the roof, which was leaking, and built a whole new building on the, above it, you know, but this floor and uh, this wall, or like actually just the floor, this was the high cinema, and then in the 80s it was uh, TC's restaurant, which uh, I was a waiter here, and actually in uh, the summer of 1988, I was the waiter, busboy, um, bartender, and host, you know, seven days a week for six months, where I got here every day at 7 a.m., and I would uh, seat all the customers, serve them their meals, make their coffee, bring them their coffee, and if they wanted a cocktail, I would make a cocktail right over here where the bar was. And I had a few regular customers that came in every day at 7 a.m. for alcoholic drinks, you know. One of them was an English professor. He taught um, advanced placement English at Longmont High. And every day he would come over here and sit down and um, I would say, good morning, professor. And he would have like three eggs, hash browns, three grand marnies, you know, at 7 a.m. every day, you know. And then he would sit here until 2, and then he would go home and garden and take a nap, and then he would come back after dinner for his second round of drinking. So he would get up every morning at like 5 or 6, get drunk, go back to sleep at 3 or 4, and then get up again in the evening and come and get drunk again, and then go back to sleep again. So he had um, actually two full shifts of drinking and sleeping every day. So he was in, in a way living two lifetimes. Um, you know, every day he was uh, getting up and going to sleep twice. So he was living two days for every one of yours. And another guy that did that same thing, they're actually fixing the microphone. I can take care of this while they're doing that. Is W.H. Auden, there we go who uh, wrote some great American poems. Uh, he was doing the same thing in the early 60s. He was a well-known poet all over the world, and he was uh, um, uh, drinking two shifts a day at the Holiday Bar on the Lower East Side where he was doing the exact same thing except in his pajamas. His house in the Lower East Side in Manhattan, there's a bronze plaque on it. It says this is where W.H. Auden lived in the 60s. And, he would actually get up in the morning, bright and early, and he would go downstairs to the bar in his robe and slippers and his pajamas and get wasted every morning, you know? And then he would go back to sleep and do it again in the evening. Hello, how are you today? Yeah, I know, I know where you are. Very nice outfit. You missed the, you're a month late though for the Halloween reading. Yeah, that was on October 30th. So uh, we've got some sound going. We have our old trusty sound man, Max, back at the board. Our baristas tonight are uh, Anna, not Anna, but Anna. Let's have a nice round of applause for Anna. <laughs> she's not only gorgeous and really personable, but makes an excellent cup of coffee. And uh, she's really a fine barista that came in second place at Joe's Espresso First Annual Barista Contest. And uh, she can make a spider web on the top of a mocha like nobody's business. And uh, that's John Jenkins, the owner over there. Let's have a nice round of applause for Mr. John Jenkins. And uh, the new guy, uh, I don't know his name yet. Ryan. Ryan, let's, Ryan's the new barista. Let's have a round of applause for Ryan, too. Ryan doesn't even work here. That's the amazing Yeah, thing. that's an amazing thing. He's, uh, he's just a temp. He's and what, to the, what is the least expensive drink that you serve? 
And how much is it? 145 right now. Okay, and then you get a refill for how much? So um, they're, uh, they've asked me to announce, not the baristas, but the management, to, that if uh, everyone could purchase one drink, you know, at the beginning of the night, then they would have a better time paying the bills here. With the rent and four owners and 25 employees, they, you know, this flourishing business still has to make an unbelievable amount of money every day just to break even. And they hoped uh, to do better than they're doing now, and they probably will flourish in the future, you know. Otherwise, they'll have to break through that wall and put the beat bookshop back there. So um, you're not, you know, so if you are enjoying the evening tonight, we're not going to be collecting money, but uh, we, it's great if you could buy a drink and, uh, you know, you can, they start at $1.50, so I'm sure everyone can afford $1.50. So welcome, and uh, that long preamble, we had to get the microphone working. I'm Tom Peters, your host. If you just arrived, uh, tonight is our 990th Monday night in a row to present poetry readings. I'm already putting this young lady to sleep. We have uh, Dylan Hawk over here. He's videoing the night. He has the steadiest hand in show business, and he will be uh, posting these DVD uh, uh, streaming online things on his website, which is watching the wheels of blackbird.com, a blog spot, or a blogspot.com. That's it. And uh, it's also, you can go to myspace.com, watching the wheels, or watching uh, the myspace.com slash so you're a poet, and then you can watch them there either, or you can listen to them and watch them here in this room tonight. So we have 15 special guests invited to read for 10 minutes each tonight. Before that, we're going to have a short open reading. So. Other than the people that are invited to read in the featured part of the evening, how many of you would like to participate in the open reading? Okay, I'll get some paper, we'll get rolling. Does anyone have an excellent piece of paper? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is actually the first time I've read. I've been here a few times, and um, I kind of believe in giving a little bit of background about that. About, uh, where the story comes from, and you know, even though the person I'm with just said everybody's a poet, I don't profess to be a poet, so this is what it is. But this, uh, these next two or three um, poems were written during a very difficult time about a, a couple summers ago, and I'm still moving through it, so my hope is tonight that I kind of get it out there and I can, can move on. And this first one is called Street Corner Advice, and it took some time where I kind of lost it, and uh, went up into the mountains for a while and then somehow I ended up in Costa Rica and then came back through Los Angeles and had a pretty um, pretty interesting encounter with a homeless man in Los Angeles. This is called Street Corner Advice. What's the difference, him and me, man on the streets, no place to be? His years may have passed, decisions, revisions, life's trespassed, eyes, eyes piercing, hood pulled tight, Mind the same, awake at night. Why deny, quick to judge, he's no grudge to you and I, walk on by. Act as if he's not there, could easily be you if you're not awake, aware. To life's lessons, change the world by change within. What's his purpose, origin? Look closely in a wink, he sees your soul, depths you'll sink. To conform, maintain, escape, cold on the street beneath his cape. Rest his soul at peace, desires in control, internal lies, your parole. Each day he spends in contemplation exceeds your life of frustration. But they said that your ghosts leave the stage like before you do when you're acting, you know? Like the, the teacher was always saying that they could, you know, see the actor exiting the stage before they were through their last sense of their line, you know, and uh, you see the poetry reading sometimes where people are, like they have their next poem that they really want to read and then they chicken out at the last second, so. <laughs> so really funny stuff. So next we have Dylan who's videotaping tonight and he's a great guy and has a really amazing online zine that you guys should all check out. Let's have a thunderous welcome for Mr. Dylan Hoke. Is it Hoke or Hawk or? Hawk. Hawk, Dylan Hawk. Let's hear it for Dylan Hawk. From uh, Marquette, Michigan. I'm skiing in, actually, but who cares? Are you um, friends with Honeybee in Marquette? 
No, I'm from Muskegon. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I do videotape these. I just started that a few readings ago. And I uh, just want to let everyone know that if you don't see yourself in the videotape, it's nothing personal. Just, I can only fit so much, you know, on there, and these go a few hours at a time, so I have to make edits, but hopefully over time, we'll get everybody in there. Um, and, okay, so let's read some poems. Uh, I don't like to title them, so I'll just let them go. Okay. Oh, and this is kind of important. Um, I stole the phrase in this poem from poet Peter Orlovsky, so we'll see if you can guess which one. I think it's fairly obvious. <laughs> and who are you if not a dancer? Brought up, innocent, pumped full of strawberry jam pussy. He'd rather be someone to forget you. Fingers tapping the phone, lips apart, falling. So what is all? Stiff shirt, stray dogs, alone in the woods on a Wednesday. And uh, she's not here because she has a bad back, but we've been talking about our crazy grandparents. And I wrote this uh, more than a year ago, but um, coincidentally it has Thanksgiving in it, so. Uh, and this is one of the few I did title called Grandparents. Same as before, they pull into the driveway until they don't pull in at all, and stand hellos, smiling at the door, undoing garments and sleeves. If you're young, kisses and pinches, or old, hugs, hugs and warm greetings, setting tables and turkeys cooling, presents and questions with the gravy. What have you been doing? How is school? A typical Rockwellian agenda? Until a point, until one day that, that's it and you never see them again, though they live and live, wearing out their years in a toll booth in Georgia, the rest in Atlanta. This one is, this, this is a short, I have a couple, a few short poems here. Uh, this one's for Mork, uh, from Mork and Mindy. It's called To Mork for Lunch. Um, and I actually wrote this before I got to Bowl. Sit tea with me, my dear, and tell me, what does your stiff little finger want with all that soup? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not. Uh, dear Prudence, the words in my head that spill out on the bed of indestructible cattiness will alter my tongue that speaks to you soft words without. We have two more short ones. This one, uh, oh, whatever. Every day it's enough beautiful to see you smile softer than magnets repel, stinking feet hematite and gold, to see your eyes again, again, the blue train, dirty brown, see the sunrise from a filthy tunnel, love desired but hardly held, and I, older in red footy pajamas, man-child in a monkey suit, ill-favored and lost underground to poetry and unabashed reckless havoc, I will not bite the stereo playing through my mind, skip, skip, bite, 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 until the dogs come home, pick supply the idea of cross-Atlantic intervention, and the marvelous hostels of which I'll never reach, bag their doors with silicone, and burn the matches from their books. And this is, uh, I think, might be shorter than a haiku, and it's my last one. It's called The Last Cookie. Without even asking, I see the crumbs in your eyes. Thanks. <laughs> say too that uh, Tom, I don't know if he's going to be too bashful to say it, I doubt it, but <laughs> he's got a new book out, I read it, it's great, so if you're lucky, he'll tell you about it. Dylan's a really nice guy, and I hope you guys can look at his online zine. If the internet was good for anything, it's great to be able to post, be able to have magazines without uh, spending their life savings on paper and staples and stuff, and not getting anyone to buy them. Now you can read them for free and print them for free. All you need is a computer. So uh, next week, uh, which uh, quote was from Peter Olavsky, Dylan? We didn't, we didn't guess. Oh yeah. Oh really? I didn't think you'd have to. No, it's just a phrase. Which phrase? Strawberry jam pussy. Strawberry jam pussy, nice. Yeah, apparently he asked the class of his at Naropa if, uh, if, he, if well, this one student thought this other student's pussy tasted like strawberry jam, <laughs> and it caused a big upstir, so I thought... He's one of the greatest guys that ever lived. <laughs>
cool. I have a hundred new pieces about him, Peter Lasky, too. Um, uh, he made me cry like a few times the first few times I met him. I, uh, I, he was my, in my mind, like he was my like imaginary friend because when I'd read these uh, Jack Kerouac books, I always loved him and his brother, you know, and his brother would always ask Jack Kerouac, what'd you dream, you know? And when I was just like a lonely poet reading these books, I'd always think these guys are so great and uh, I never could imagine meeting them in my whole life. And so the first time I met Peter Lasky, he was doing laps around Naropa, you know, and uh, around the building with uh, meditation beats and he wasn't talking, you know, and he was on this vow of silence and he wasn't saying anything to anyone, but he was teaching at Naropa that week and so, Alan, and he was being paid, and Alan Ginsberg was so mad at him because he wouldn't talk in the classes where he was the teacher, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, he was smoking a cigarette really, like, furiously, and I was standing in front of him, and I was like, hi, Peter, and uh, I was looking at him, and I was, like, so bummed out that he wouldn't say anything to me, you know? But I wasn't bugging him, I was just standing there, you know? And then he throws his cigarette on the ground, you know? And I pick it up and hand it back to him, you know? And, uh... And then he's and then he's like this, you know, like thank you, you know, and he's like, oh, fuck you, and he like threw it on the ground again, like he just kept it fell on the ground, and I picked it up and handed it to him, and he put it back in his mouth, and then when he realized that, you know, I was trying to help him, he threw it on the ground again, and so then we were in the Shambhala classroom in the Lincoln Building, which had all these beautiful windows that went out over uh, the over Boulder, and where you could see the flat irons and. Alan Ginsberg had said that the devil's thumb, it was the first time I'd ever heard it. And he was like, you know, the, everyone write a haiku, and he was like, um, you know, basketball court uh, under the flat irons, devil's thumb, so what? You know? And uh, he was saying how they're supposed to have these three uh, different ideas, and he was talking about Basho, and then he looked at Peter Olofsky and said, do you have a haiku for the class, Mr. Olofsky? And he said, eat shit and die. You know, and that was the first thing he'd said in two weeks. And I, I wrote it down, and I was like, my whole life I thought eat shit and die meant eat shit, eat my shit, and, and die. I thought it was like a curse where you were like, eat shit and drop dead. And I was like, and as soon as Peter Lasky said eat shit and die in the context of these three lines haikus, where the last line sums it up. I thought, oh, eat, shit, and die. That's what everyone in the human race does. It's like, you know, pay taxes or whatever, you know, eat shit, and then you die, you know? And I was like, boy, he's really, that's the best haiku of the day, you know? <laughs> and uh, he was, um, uh, then that day, um, the, like the June 23rd, 1987, he, um, all these kids were coming to the people that, that were running the rope and saying, uh, this man, Peter Olofsky, is really upsetting me and he's acting like my drunk dad and it's making me cry and all these different, you know, and wanted to go back, you know? And I remember like walking home down Pearl Street and I looked and I was thinking about Allen Ginsberg as like my conscience, you know? And I looked in the sewer and there was a, there was a flyer for an Europa reading with Allen Ginsberg's face, you know, like the, it had washed down in the sewer and it was face up in the sewer, you know? And so I was thinking about him and I, I walked over to my house and all these people were being so mean to Peter Olofsky that I, um, I had this empathy for him that I just started crying and I couldn't stop crying. And uh, William S. Burroughs had said that same day in class that if you start crying for no reason, watch out because something really substantial is going to happen. This is all on tape and he was saying that the day he shot his wife, he cried uncontrollably that day. And then he was, and he thought that was the, do you remember the name of it, Todd? Like, not the inner demon, but, uh, you know, like the big, the, the, the bad spirit. There's something about this spirit that comes into you and takes you over temporarily that he was talking about. And he was saying, if you ever start crying for no reason, like, really watch out. And he was, uh, Todd was the charge of the summer writing program that summer. And he was in the Kappa Sig house at, uh, up on campus uh, talking about, Someone asked him about shooting his wife, and he had tears in his eyes, you know? And you could tell that it was just a terrible experience. And I think a lot of people were like, oh, here's this drug addict that shot his wife. He's really cool. And I really think he felt terrible about it his whole life. And, you know, he was talking about how he started using narcotics so he could cure his nightmares, you know? Which he said he was plagued by horrible nightmares, and someone had told him that opium would stop him from dreaming completely, you know? And he was talking really sensitively about how what a bad experience it was and then uh, killed, shooting his wife accidentally, and his drug addiction was no great surprise. And 
every one of the things that every year uh, when he'd come back, he'd talk for 90 minutes and then there'd be a question and answers, you know? And people would be so scared that none of the questions made any sense, you know? And this one kid, one time, uh, Joe, Joe Ritchie asked a question, and this kid said, I'm, I've got this ring, and I wonder if you could tell me anything about it, you know? And he's like, well, I'm not a jeweler, but I'd be happy to look at it if you come up here, you know? And then, uh, and then people were just asking these questions that were so far off the wall that there was no way that he could do anything in that. That lecture he gave in the summer of 87 when he was talking about cats uh, waking him up in the middle of the night, and uh, he, then he'd write down his dreams. One of his cats would sit on his chest and purr in his mouth, and then he would wake up and write down his dreams. Uh, I got Randy to transcribe that lecture, this 90-minute lecture, and I still have this manuscript at home that we published in Bombay Gym that was like, uh, 90 pages long of just one lecture at Naropa, you know, which uh, if a book of those ever comes out It'll be really fantastic but, uh, Yeah, the wishing machine that was a different year. That was the 86 the year the one that uh, that uh, that Randy uh, Type script was from 87 when it was at Naropa actually in 86 he, he assigned the class to make a wishing machine and he passed out um plans for the wishing machine and he said that we should get one in the class and we should all decide on what to wish for we should all simultaneously wish for one thing together while the wishing machine was turned on to see if it would work you know and then uh, the next day he said well did any of you guys make the wishing machine which he handed out plans for and asked every student in the class to make one and nobody did it and he was like oh well you know what young people today you know you guys pay your money you come out here I ask you to do something and nobody does it you know but uh that same, uh, they had a panel that day where uh, John Steinbeck IV was on the panel, and uh, he was saying, they were like, people were saying different things about their lives, and he was saying how uh, Vietnam was the best time he ever had in his life, you know? And, uh, and I, afterwards, I came up to him, and I was like, Mr. Steinbeck, he was John Steinbeck's son, uh, John, and... Uh, I was like, Mr. Steinbeck, can I interview you sometime about how come Vietnam was so much fun, you know? And because I really, everyone's always talking about how terrible it was. And he's like, oh man, the food was so great and the prostitutes were excellent and they had the best drugs, you know? And I was like, can we go out and talk about it? And he was a recovering alcoholic, so we used to go to the Boldorado and drink coffee behind the desk there, which is now the manager's office. And he would tell me about how Vietnam was like the most fun place in the whole world during the Vietnam War, and uh, his best friend, Sean Flynn, uh, the class wrote a song about Errol Flynn's son who disappeared motorcycling through Vietnam as a photojournalist, but uh, this guy, John Steinbeck IV, he passed away too, but he was a great guy. Since he's dead, I could say this about him, I hope this doesn't go on your videotape, but uh, not, he didn't have enough money, so he gave the drug dealer the title to his car for a quarter <laughs> gram of cocaine, which cost 25 bucks. He's like, if I don't pay you back, you can keep my title, you know. So this guy still has the title to his car, but not his car. So uh, that was, uh, next we have Gregory. Let's have a thunderous welcome for Gregory. My birthday. <laughs> and, uh, I've, I've reached an age where I've become hesitant about telling just how old I am. <laughs> And this poem sort of follows that. I'm courting a young poet, poetess. It's a beach poem. Shall we grant the gray curling sea enduring majesty and hold he sings with lasting time-worn song or least majesty say only the old white-bearded man dragging sand stumbles and unceremoniously falls face flat on flat land and tumbling forth on all fours embarrassingly rails and roars of cruel beachings and shallow seas and most unhumbly of times terribly out of hand. The sudden robin and following falling meadow lark lilt sound cascading within in my meandering heart with the self-same pastel startlement of lupin and yarrow and wild rock rose bursting unbidden source unseen through the evening light brush throat grays and blues settling suffused in soft concert cast across the many mottled greens of this 
wondered and wandering world. Uh, these next two poems kind of go together. Uh, the naiads were the Greek uh, sort of mini gods of flowing streams. And I'll read the two together in one. Naiads, tumbling tenor and basso, contralto, alto, mezzo, soprano, baritone, voice, bedrock, worn, water, soft, carved, smooth, and swirled into molten song, coursing in endless, countless, percussive chorus, curved, cur curved, curving with drooping, dropping bend of earth, air, and ear, until in distance sung silent, singing still yet seldom understood. And with what voices sang the Titans? Risen from the earth hold not we birth, blood, and body memory of magma and ice, of rising peaks and primal seas, the so the slow sift and press of silt and sediment, continental drift, sudden tremor and shift, avalanche and flood, and from far before informing the swirled and timber-filled stone carved and cold now beneath this singing, clear waters fall, a molten core, two once moving in plunging orange, dance and roar. Wet river stones, it was in a time of spring within, in that brisk, dense beauty of April when beneath the thatched and matted long-leafed grasses lain low by ice and wet, weighted winter snow, thin voices awake and sing a rhythmic, delicate, deliberate and dazed, moving, hesitant, with half-hidden dance within. A time when over the low hills, lined in chorus overlapping, arc-winged geese ride dark-eyed and calling, with wings beating strong and time sculling like galley oars bending into the bending wind. A time when life struck sighs and strikes all within, quick with green. It was then when we walked hip to hip and hand to hand, excuse me, it was then when we walked hip to hip and hand to hand open to opening sky and open land and embodied and abandoned we caromed and ricocheted, precipitous and careless, perilous, cascading, winter filled, melting, sparkled with singing glance and as with words in play, we glistened and shone like tumbled smooth, wet river stones. And one last poem, Walking Like a Choo Choo Train. My street curb, curbside, sidewalk, walk is this day now most madly arrayed, succinctly, distinctly, staccato, henna tattooed, lined and splayed, popped sublime with fallen, falling, Pale crab apple, pink and purple blossom petals, tossed, scattered, cast, pattering lines, soft, soft, supine across the hard and cold, flat across, concrete gray, lasting, alas, less than a wandering, streaming wayside, walking like a choo choo train, segwayed, wind blown, petal strewn, sunlit, late. Late spring day, this street walk, walk now become a welcome wayfaring walkway, walk away, walk home. Thank you. Um, so the next part of the evening, we have uh, like 15 people. We had we started this reading series here in February of, 19, of this year, and but the reading series itself began 19 years. Could you please turn the top thing to midnight so that it doesn't feedback like that? That's, that's worse, thanks. Just 12, straight up and down at midnight? Thanks. It's feeding back. Sorry, Max. 
just really distracting. That's perfect. That's Max over there on the soundboard. Uh, we started 19 years ago tonight, so we did it 52 weeks a year for the last 19 years. And there's some flyers under the tables when Randy Rourke read with Jack Collum on 11 23 We haven't missed a Monday since then, uh, we being me and Gary. And uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, so the, we, this year, in, from February 22nd until now, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, the last 10 months we had um, like uh, two featured readings a month with two featured readers. And um, so about 15 of those people are here tonight. They're going to read for 10 minutes each. So uh, 920 minus 11 uh, hour 40 minutes, 100 minutes. So we have 100 minutes and 14 people reading for nine minutes each. So that'll bring us to 11 o'clock. And uh, my friend Troy, who wasn't one of our featured readers this year, but will be one soon, it was one of the people that I invited to do something that wasn't didn't feature this year yet because him and Jonathan want to do something uh, in the next few months. So our first of the people will be Troy. And are you ready, Troy? Let's have a nice warm welcome for Troy. Begin with your unrevised nonsense. Where in my initial email were you invited to respond with your thoughts? It is the office's policy not to deal with lunatics, especially ones no different from your average 20-something counterculturalist. We may have been afraid of you in the 1960s, but now you just make us yawn. And that takes time away from fetching danishes and coffee and fixing jams in our fax machine and gossiping about Grey's Anatomy and wiping our boogers all over the million shitty manuscripts we pretend to read a day. By the way, I only read the first chapter of your book, and it was enough to clearly get the picture of how shitty it is. This email I'm writing now is cutting into my dwelling and self-satisfaction about my position in lifetime. I am on the fast track to wealth and security and love that you will never have it. Keep on trucking with your revolution, hippie. We both know your beliefs are directly related to your laziness and oversensitivity. Let's face it, you just can't hack it in the real world. You're the type who got D's on your grade school grammar test, and now you say your writing is experimental to make up for it. I'm sick of you. You're a loser. Even if you do, by miracle, get this pile of shit published and sell some copies, we will buy it eventually and take our cut. We don't have to take risks. We always win. All the best wishes, the industry. P.S. If you haven't yet considered quitting all aspirations regarding professional writing, please start now. <laughs> Last night at the Laughing Go. Her eyes were watery, and her words were slurred, and her complexion was ragged, but her excitement was clear. She was sitting with her boyfriend at a table in the back of the room, and she got up and stood beside me when she saw me pouring a glass of water near the front door, afraid I might be leaving. I'd done what I'd agreed to do and was thirsty. I'd read a handful of poems and shown a short film I'd made on a Jean Cocteau, and she was about to read and asked if I'd be willing to listen and let her know what I thought. We chatted about Cocteau, whom her parents had known when they lived in France in the 50s. Her parents were rich bohemians, and she'd grown up in Aspen with Hunter Thompson as her godfather. When her name was called, she swaggered to the stage, and I found a table near the front, close enough that I could read her face. She carried a large black notebook with colored chalk drawings of a black cat on the cover. She read breathlessly and much too fast in a strange falsetto, a voice you'd never hear on the street. There was music in her poems, but she was self-conscious and disconnected from what she was trying to say. So she replaced expressing the genuine feelings in her poems for a brittle emphasis on the words themselves, which were already much too loaded. She regularly looked up to be sure I was listening and that I was enjoying myself. At one point, she stopped in the middle of a poem and looked up at me three times in quick succession, as if she couldn't believe what she'd just seen, each time lingering a little bit longer and a little slower, until in the middle of the third glance, she stared into my eyes until the room grew quiet, until she was sure of who I was and what I was thinking. And as she did this, her whole body visibly relaxed, and she started to smile, first at me, and then at the page. When she began to read again, her voice 
jumped out of her mouth. She'd rediscovered the song inside her words. Now that I could hear her better as she read, it was obvious that she had thoroughly read the French Surrealist and that she was incorporating cut-ups and appropriations in the same way Pound had by twisting the original meaning and making it ironic or uprooting the images and dropping them in a new context, thus doubling their meaning. Her long white fingers flashed out the rhythm of the poem and she read just the right amount of time and ended on one of her better lines. Then she smiled and bowed and walked straight to my table and threw herself into the chair beside me. Instead of beginning a conversation, the reading wasn't over, I opened her notebook and began paging through it slowly. Each page was a mixture of text and illustrations, a parrot and colored pencil, a black cat and ink, rough portraits, bare feet, shoes, and hands drawn in pencil, each illustration so different it could have been made by a different hand, each of them executed by a trained eye. As I went through the pages, she leaned over and whispered to me about how she had used the book, where it had traveled to, how long it had taken to fill it, why I was supposed to read it from the back to the front. With her lips near my ears, I could smell both jasmine and gin. I read, with my t I read it with my fingertips, wanting to touch the letters and illustrations and the rough paper of the notebook. She was pointing things out to me at the same time, so her fingers ran into each other, and each time they did, she gasped, and a little tremble ran up her arm and down into her back. The second time this happened, I pretended not to notice and turned the pages as a distraction back to front, the way I was supposed to. The date on one page was written in French, and I asked her if she was in France or if she spoke French and she immediately relaxed and sighed, oh, mais oui. Then she talked for a minute in French before she looked up and asked me in French if I knew the language. And we both laughed and I told her not a word. I told her she should try reading her poems in French sometime or incorporating French into her readings. Because when she spoke French, her whole body relaxed and you could tell she was savoring the sound of the language on her tongue and her wrists relaxed, and she waved her hands in the air as if trying to describe the emotions the words couldn't contain. Then we talked about the diaries of Annie Nin and Henry Miller, of Cocteau's films, and at what point we both discovered Dada, and how real Marcus's book on Emmy Hennings, and Hugo Ball, and the Sex Pistols, and the Situationalists, and Guy Debord, and all that had changed our lives. Then she gave me a hug, and I gave her my number and told her to get a hold of me and we'd see where this would go. And she went back to her boyfriend and I walked onto Pearl Street and took the first left at the corner away from the center of town. There's a section of Alpine near the sanitarium that doesn't have any street lights and if I'm walking home alone at night, I sometimes walk up Alpine Hill past where the street lights end, walking backwards and looking over the mountains into the sky. And sometimes there's a moon, and sometimes, like tonight, there's only stars. And I looked at this forest of stars, and I wondered if someone were to ask me which was my favorite, how could I choose just one? Thanks. Well, I drove here all the way from Denver to read tonight. Wang Zen of wangzen.com. Uh, the Art of Living Dangerously in the 20th Century. Twilight, twilight, send me word. Memory fade, a final core cuts me off a shining sword. Living is its own reward. A spider's web with holes a curious child has poked, screaming as the arachnid chases after the clinging thread. I want to write like that child feels. This poem will kill me before I kill it. Just watch. Los Angeles is more alien to me than Kathmandu. Eight-lane freeways and 100,000 gang members and 15 million people. 
In the spring I will sacrifice myself because the new gods demand it. I try to think of the dead people I know. I can't remember names, only tones of voices and half-remembered shapes of faces like the woman on the moon. Silky hair piled off the neck, tendrils and wisps of loss or escaped strands. Underwater spiraling a cut loose, a voice like Rachel and Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. I am talking the 20th century. I am talking moving visual thinking. I am talking impacting images dropped like bombs. We are a land of memory, tape for posterity, living in the past. Before media, memories didn't fade, they became larger, grand and grandiose, skyscrapers on the mind's horizon. Do you remember your first girlfriend, boyfriend, your first nervous kiss, your last frenzied fuck? Now it can all be captured for later viewing, can I capture you? Don't worry, this isn't real. This is the world made cinder by the nightmares of a sleeping god. We chew the image to the flavor of hickory smoke and flesh bleed out. Sprinkling epitaphs on twice dead meat. We comprehend it. Sure. What befuddles the mind and makes nursery rhymes out of Einstein's misplaced notebooks is the absolute. Here follows an untranslatable insult. Needed to press that button through five billion chests through the pumping heart to crack the spine of the world and make the magma core in your faded blue jeans. One, we can't comprehend it. Obeisance and libations to a sleeping god. Pray he doesn't awake. Open eyes, crash heavy lids on a world made foil. In your face I see your ancient history and the hoofprints of the Mongol hordes and last week's betrayal when your supposed lover said, I love you, and lied. They paint a model pattern on your pubis I polish until my reflection distorts across your features. A man points a revolver in my face. He says, you have 60 seconds to justify your existence. And I say, when I was a boy, I climbed trees, avoided bumblebees and bees. Not good enough. I've fallen in love at first sight, shit in my pants, and flown a kite. You now have 50 seconds to justify your existence. And I answer. Two years ago, I was beat by a gang of eight armed with pipes for apparently no reason I could think of. And when I woke, I thought, what a funny dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was a technicolor nightmare. Scene one, eight men approached me on the seat, streets of San Francisco, fists raised in solidarity. Blackout. Scene two, I'm on the ground, kicking at them, close up of a boot, dancing a can-can on my head. I think, wait a second, this isn't La Caja Faux. One, two, cha-cha-cha, three, four, cha-cha-cha. Blackout. Scene three, I'm on my knees. They are in a circle around me, like a circle jerk or some sort of Iron John drumming ritual or an Olivetti typewriter with their fists as keys, using my head for punctuation. Each one, an exclamation, points. Blackout. Fade to black. And the man with the gun says, you're getting warmer, and cocks the hammer back. I say, I remember I was leaving the hospital, and I asked the receptionist where the exit was, her face a look of horror, her mouth an open O. She pointed to my right, I turned. I saw my preformed doppelganger in the mirror darkly, my face a pumpkin the day after Halloween, lying smashed on the sidewalk, and realized why. She was horrified, and why both our mouths were an open, oh. I remember a friend saying, in a fight, if you put the other guy in the hospital, then you win. Well, I lost. And the man with the gun says, not good enough. And I say, what does it take? He says, you're dead wrong. 
You are living when every night you put a bullet in your head and every morning you are reborn, living yesterday behind and tomorrow to take care of itself when you turn off that electronic babysitter and live your own Technicolor dream. And he says, don't you recognize me? And I look at him closer and he repeats with my mirror image lips, I am talking the 20th century. I am talking moving visual thinking. I am talking impacting images dropped like bombs. And with those doppelganger lips and a head like a pumpkin smashed on the sidewalk the day after Halloween, he says, I am your future ex-wife and tomorrow's child. I am you if you never want to live again. And he said, I want you to live. I want you to write like Nikola Tesla thinks. I want you to bring the world to its knees. That's all. And I smile as his finger tightens on the trigger and I hear a voice. Twilight, twilight, send me word, memory fade, a final core, cuts me off a shining sword. Living is its own reward. Hello. Thank you, Tom, for everything. Are you going to listen to me? Yeah, of course. Okay. I listen to everyone. Um, I'd like to dedicate this reading to Lee Harrison. Uh, um, Trying not to be up here, uh, trying to be some particular kind of person that you'll think is cool, as we all say, or more specifically, uh, poetic. Uh, but I might have been when I wrote this, uh, he said, uh, pointing in both directions, as is my habit, uh, like the scarecrow, or like Emily Dickinson's dashes, or the this and that, that uh, Naropa got so worked over by last Monday night. Uh, my piece tonight is entirely inspired by last week's reading when I had the really extraordinary pleasure of uh, pre-reading hours with uh, Joe and Gary, who I wish were here, and Sue at Randy's, who are here. And it, not until after uh, their terrific readings, I realized like, what a very particular family uh, these people are to me whose uh, family of origin uh, fast withereth. Um, my uh, brother's uh, gone a little more than 10 years now, and my father died last fall, and my mother steadily disappears in dementia. And my older sister essentially kidnapped her after the funeral, and no one could visit them for six months while she stole most of my mom's money. So she's not seeming uh, like much of a sister in this moment, which leaves my younger sister Sharon. And then there are uh, Joe and Gary and Randy and Sue and, and Tom, you too, uh, who are a quite different uh, but just as definite a family of origin, uh, for example, of the reasons why I'm here now. Um, and uh, their readings were all uh, mature and appealing and instructive and uh, like I meant to be getting at, uh, Sue's especially inspired me to wonder what really is worth writing about besides uh, what one has loved and I made some notes on those in the meantime. Uh, I swore to do no work today and did not. Uh, until this year, I was teaching both in person at UNC in Greeley and at a distance for CU, which is my one job now and a source of self-scheduling adventures. Uh, so by noon today, I already played for three hours, uh, guitar, usually singing. I think sometimes if it weren't for compulsive behavior, I would have no behavior. Uh, I'm pretending my next career, uh, maybe my last one, is as a songwriter, at which I am experienced. I've written one good song about every six years. Uh, so I'm not even uh, overdue yet, uh, hoping to improve uh, 
Usually singing and playing is a private, semi-private behavior. Uh, though last month, at my housewarming, um, I took half a hit of ecstasy for the first time. Um, this sort of lodge in Chautauqua with an inside balcony uh, behind which is my uh, a garret reminding me of Paris. Uh, but up, up near the top of this 20 foot high ceiling with some good acoustics and there was party performing up there um, in accordance with the invitation and after the what turned out to be highly successful moose draping, uh, I gave my most relaxed and expressive session ever yet. It was not only easy to breathe, it was a great joy to do so. Um, and, uh, anyway, uh, around noon today I started to collect the week's notes and thoughts. And first, I was uh, reminded that Gary's uh, Naropa Talopa Samsara story uh, materialized for me the earliest poem I remember mattering. Does anybody else know this poem? Uh, one bright morning in the middle of the night, two dead men got up and started to fight. Back to back, they drew out their knives and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came and killed those two dead boys. And if you don't believe my story is true, ask the blind man. He saw it too. Has anybody ever heard that poem? Yeah, yeah, great. Right. I knew it. I knew it wasn't unique to me. Anyway, uh, last week's reading also uh, reminded me to think a lot about Lee Harrison. And I want to say that uh, in the following piece, when I say the words Lee Harrison, they will sometimes mean Lee Harrison the person who kept Rufus for me in his grandmother's house in Tyler, Texas when Effie and I took our European tour and sometimes refer to a code person, though both won't apply yet since the words Lee Harrison appear only once more after this so far. Uh, I don't think there were many Catholic people when I grew up in Edinburgh, uh, but certainly it was Mary Palmgrass who sought me out for my first serious kiss at a kindergarten birthday party uh, under the table. Uh, was this before or after some problem? I called her a good Catholic girl in the playground. Uh, she was on a swing. What did I know? I was only five years old. I could only have heard it from someone. Uh, and she was extraordinarily Ohio, apple-cheeked in my memory, a total knockout. Uh, unfortunately, Mary Palmgrass that didn't ride my bus. But Lewis Boggs was one of two people. Either the grade school kid who sat alone and ate his own snot every day, as if warding off some evil on the bus, or he was the freshman covered from the waist up in boiling acne that no one else in my gym class was, whose name I now remember as something like Kenny McCord, and because I felt it could be some sort of sad last straw for Kenny, wary and defiant like a cat. I didn't hesitate to wrestle him. I didn't hesitate to wrestle him. I wasn't very strong except for my weight class. Uh, I was wiry, uh, lithe. Francesca's mother, China, uh, later. Uh, Francesca's mother, China, called me later. The only time ever anyone has ever been referred to as live in my presence. Uh, I remember a mighty wrestle. At the end of that year, I moved to Pittsburgh and developed big African keloid scarring acne on my face and especially back. Uh, like no one in my acne family history. Uh, it was so bad and I was so badly self-conscious of it that when I went to the doctor, I stole a page from his prescription pad to write my gym teacher a note about not having to participate in basketball's uh, shirts and skin season. Um, and I didn't shower after gym, just furtively changed shirts, and for years I wore a t-shirt when I made love. And this may have included the most sexually active period 
including two years on and off with Francesca, who may never have seen me shirtless, despite we lived together in Jerusalem the year after the Olympic terrors in Munich. Uh, I must never have showered or bathed with any girlfriends until much later, by which time we would have been quite dirty. Uh, the first such shower I remember involves Anne in a chair uh, at Lake Hapathong, so that might have been the summer I bared all. Uh, I don't remember ever being intentionally mean to outsider kids, like Kevin Bacon and Kiefer Sutherland, as rival young residents for the heart of Julie Roberts and flatliners that gave themselves so much grief over on the other side. Um, Lee, Lee Harrison, do you remember when you invited me to share your bed? A twin futon, barely softer than the floor and barely bigger than either of us? We weren't to touch. Uh, something about herpes? Or I wonder if I was there to make your man mad? And I always did love and desire you enough sometimes to imagine life as your boyfriend, but I'm not big and strong like the real ones have been. I may not have a big cock, but I have more balls than any of them. Three. Uh, really, you'd probably have to say four by now. I may not have a big cock, but I'm not the only one ever to have treated it fondly. Uh, I may not have a big cock, but I may, but sometimes more than others. Um, Thin, that woman that Robert Creeley knew in Union, Maine, called it, who wanted to seduce me but didn't want to go through with it in some way that I've generally assumed had nothing to do with my size, but sometimes imagined involved some feminist gesture. Anyway, the little bed was in your house on Spruce. I later lived and loved other women in, Caroline and Baby, also previously Francesca, when it was torn down. And that was a trend for a while, getting out of houses just before they were demolished. Uh, you'd recognize the sheet music cabinet I refinished and gave to my mother and father. Um, I only had 10 minutes and now I'm uh, 31 in my story of loves. Um, Sienna won't even be born for another six years. I want to make natural, magical, Sylvia Plath, heart crane language kinds of sentences like the sleeved sound of a hand sliding down wound strings in a sleeve, or happy and sad rain the family's various blue eyes and embraces the how much I love you category of songs. Uh, but my most poetic thing lately is songs. And so should I sing one time? Well, you, whatever you want. I mean, you, you, your 10 minutes is up, but uh, yeah. there's two more. I'm not the only person who would have taken more than 10 minutes. Right, but if the coffee shop closes in five minutes. Okay, I'll skip it. Yeah, but you can, you know. I'll, I'll skip it. Can you, can I? That movie, uh, uh, Flatliners, I think I'm one of the few really big fans of that movie. I own a copy of it on VHS videotape. And it's so dramatic when, uh, they're being visited by the ghost of the person they were mean to as a kid, you know, that is so incredibly dramatic, you know. And, uh, you know, just for your benefit and the audience's too, like, uh, I mean, uh, Gary Allen had to build, like, really scarring acne, and so did Charles Bukowski. And did you read Charles Bukowski's novel, Ham on Rhyme, where he talks about it in detail? No. Yeah, he had such terrible acne as a child that he didn't have a friend until he was in college. You know, and it's like this great heroic, uh, I have goosebumps just thinking about it, but when he was at Long Beach City College, the best football player on the Long Beach City College team, you know, uh, they were at like a cafeteria, you know, he was born in 1920, so this was probably like in 1942 or something. He's at Long Beach City College and no one had ever been a friend to him his whole life, and his dad yelled at him and beat him on a daily basis, you know, and his mom was just scared and kind of nice, you know. But the captain of the football team called him over to the table in the cafeteria and said, hey, Bukowski, I heard you're really smart, you know? And then he introduced him to all his friends and his beautiful girlfriend, and then all these people that the captain of the football team introduced him to all were nice to him for the rest of his college career, you know? And he began making friends after that, you know? He, um, uh, he 
his girlfriend Jane from Jane Clooney Baker, who's Jane in Barfly, you know, and I was the girl that played her in. Well, this girl, in fact, Totem died, who I had met in real life before, uh, Adrian Shelley. She was 40 years old, one of my favorite actresses in the whole world. Uh, she passed away. She, she was murdered like two weeks ago in New York. But uh, in fact, Totem, like this girl Jane, that was his girlfriend for 10 years, uh, her son called me out of the phone book 10 years ago, and he offered to sell me the two books that Charles Bukowski had signed to his 10-year girlfriend, who was this guy's mom. And this guy despised Charles Bukowski, you know? And uh, he sold me uh, Bukowski's first two copies of his first two books signed to his mother, you know? One of them I sold to John Martin, owner of Black Sparrow Press. These were really like the holy grail of all Bukowski books, you know? I actually offered the guy a thousand bucks for him, you know, 11 years ago, when if he'd taken him into a bookstore in Denver, he would have been lucky to get 50, you know? And then eight years later, when he sold it to me, I offered him another grand and he turned it down. I was like, they're worth more now than they were 10 years ago. Can I give you 2,000 for them? And he said, no, 1,000 is enough. How much did Peter Martin pay? John Martin. John. He paid a lot of money for them. More money than he'd ever paid for a single book in his whole life, probably. But, uh, like, this, his, her son had, had imagined or seen uh, Bukowski kick dirt into his mother's grave at her funeral. And he despised him ever since that day, you know? She was 10 years older than Bukowski. So uh, this is my poem. I'm going to read tonight. I have five minutes left since I gave a five-minute introduction. See if I can read it in that amount of time. And uh, I'd like to dedicate this to my friends who are still here in the room. And uh, the copies of this book are for sale today. It's called The Book of Silence. It was originally called According to Hoyle, but I changed the name of it. <laughs> in my dream, they asked if anyone would like to read with Diane de Prima. I raised my hand. You need multiple PhDs to be taken seriously. Men talking about feminism is like the deaf signing about music, she said. It is possible, I responded. Young man, you have to make it a surprise as long as it is out of this world. They kept referring back to the language of the birds. The hopes of my life are bound up in him. Hey ho, the lark and the owl, the path of the bird annihilates east and west. In the grove, the fallen trees are many. You have to break out in song, invoked by a band of armed dancers with the cult of Creeleys at Black Mountain. The ritual of the minstrels are numberless. I vow to kill the fetus, the angry messiahs with no hope of this world went out in the air to wail and become elegant. But we don't have to go there. It has to do with knowing every time a poet puts down two words, you split into two, the bishop and the tomb. Dividing the line, slowing down enough to draw from a deeper place with a line or two that can lead somewhere away from the water where you have been, the other voices go. And this part about uh, every time a poet puts down two words, you split into two. Andre Kudrescu told me that um, when he knew two words in English, he was already a poet in this language. He said he knew two English words and he, he considered himself to be a poet in English. I've been watching your captors. They do not labor anymore in the human crucible. Water into will, down, down. We visit the interior where things are not disturbed. Sitting, watching you dance in happy hours, in vegetable silver, in the growing erotic tensions across distances by Mother Boot Goose. You like it by the side of the phone. We discuss an issue in a voice that commands attention like a Greek chorus affected by a speech given by the opposite sex or the mystics around, trusting your insights who invented a magic jar with no air inside it, only knowledge that's readily available and in search of prey by mail, and the notion of tribe in the presence of Hermes who makes sounds that we make, like the thing that is signed by the sign and the emptiness of the sign, instead of a romantic hypothesis, a semiotic code, like an exact reproduction of the upside down mode of language with its roots in heaven, like the child coming up with sentences that he's never heard before. Spontaneous order arises, like heat death or entropy and accident. The nature of chaos gives rise to form like sudden change forsaken like basketball for art or space. The embryo is a being with nothing to say except that chaos is embryonic form, giving rise to the first gods 
the antithesis of divine frivolity like the dancer originating from the lack of space lying between language and seduction, its Orphic qualities bringing order out of childhood, making us two out of the languages invented by children, organs invented out of intuition, like the wolf children taken out of the forest before they are allowed to think, words beneath words, an infinite pattern of echoes and repetitions, embedded in language, hawk gods carrying us away from language without death, moving us closer to things that resemble themselves, arcane like street cleaners at 4 a.m. in Hermetic Week, opposites complementary in the yellow river that precedes the universe we view as complementary, an eleventh wing unfinished there out of the egg, wanting to be scholars, throwing dictionary definitions around for two years, taking out your eyes if you wrote about yourself, or anything giving information about horses or ideal nature as in the hiding place for the hare, preceded by forlorn hope or form, giving up all hope of forlorn logic, the basis of all fiction, giving rise to questions of meter, inventing new forms, a chronology of memory about 40 feet long and five feet high, not relating to structure, remembering the green couch on the previous page, or how to deal with commas as the present gets closer, never seeing this much with your eyes, precisely the unnameable words with no cause but themselves, they glow on blades, fade and disappear, merely more weary than yesterday, a tense intelligence as dead as music, when it was first sounded with long black pauses, like Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, a whisper of final music I tried to understand, like the language of the birds, a pell-mell silence in which the grown-ups pursued me in lieu of particulars, symbolized by themselves, sitting in the corner of the grove, along guided by the wild beast language of the futurists, a game of repetition, baffling referentiality, separating form from content without allowing it to rest, almost like the thinking of the dying, a diagram of illusion, the business of looking back, at the extreme structure of future lyric, cigarettes smoking in the wind. Our last performer was also our second to last performer and our third to last performer, Todd Penny, who will be playing a song as they close and the Laughing Goat is now, will be closing after his song and thank you all for staying. And I, you know, appreciate everything and we'll um, see you next week, same time, same channel. You say that I'm not meeting your needs You say there's got to be more Well, I can tell that you got an itch You're needed toward the door You don't have to spare my feelings Now you've never tried before Don't have to draw me a picture You don't have to say no more Cause I'm gonna be the guy that you didn't think I could be
few times, but real my friend. And when he said it's only the beginning, it was the beginning of the end. And I'm gonna be the guy that you didn't think I could be. Hey, you are gonna be sorry that you did come along me. I'm gonna be on top of the world, and you're gonna be a lonely girl. And then I will come back to you if you promise to be true. If you promise to be true, if you promise to be true.